brother sent out the invitation shade. Um, we do get people pray and give their life to Jesus Christ and people impacted through this. Um, so let's use that opportunity. All right. Um, also, there, I don't know why, but there should have been some announcement regarding the uh, Christmas banquet on the uh, prices, okay? So there should be some uh, price changes to make it easy for those that uh, really want to be part and uh, they can't afford, okay? So there's that group. Then, of course, there's a group that uh, need to um, break away from the tradition that um, is a spirit in which many move in around Christmas time. I know that back in the days when we were unsaved, that we practically follow what the world did. People close the churches and they go on farms or they go at the beach. But as believers, we remain faithful. Can you say amen? We travel before and after Christmas. This is the best way to travel. And I do want to encourage you that if you ever thought of the best place to celebrate Christmas is in the house of God with your brethren. In other words, with the saints. That's basically um, the best place to do that. And I'm just talking about getting to a place and you're looking for a church to go like you have no church to attend. Folks, we must do our best to work on that tradition. I don't remember I probably, since I have been saved, right? And I remember I've not always been a pastor. I've been saved uh, uh, for so many years. And I, I remember once, once, probably my first Christmas as, a, as a, uh, somebody who uh, was a believer. That's the last one. It was the first and the last one I actually traveled to, to the north. And... Um, I saw when I came back, nobody has to speak to me. I just saw when I came back that, you know what? I think the best place to spend Christmas is here, not anywhere else. And so uh, that, that was the last one. So just to let you know, Christmas is about coming, not going. We see this in the Bible. And so uh, we see people coming, they are not going. And so I encourage you to have that in mind so that uh, we do not somehow get sucked into the culture of the world, closing churches, uh, you know, ministry crippled uh, while we are out there enjoying uh, our lives. There has to be something in us thinking about the house of God during Christmas time. Okay, so... Having said that, we want to get to the second part of worship, and uh, we call this giving. Genesis 26, if you open your Bible with me, 12 through 26. What did I say? Genesis 26, verse 12. So the Bible says, Then Isaac sowed in that land and reaped in the same year a hundredfold, and the Lord blessed him. The man began to prosper and continue, to prosper and continue prospering. He became very prosperous, for he had possession of flocks, and possessions of herds and a great number of servants. 
So the Philistines envied him. What a great place to be where believers can become so blessed that uh, the unsaved uh, begin to envy you. Now let's look at uh, one interesting truth here to encourage us as we're going to bring our offering before God. We're reading about how Isaac sold in the land and the Lord bless him. Before anything, every believer must be able to see something here. The first thing is the principle of sowing and reaping. This is obviously not what I'm, I, I'm going to talk to you about. But it's something that is there. It didn't just say Isaac reaped, but he sowed in the land. You reap what you sow. There is a principle of sowing and reaping in there. Isaac sowed and he was reaping. God blessed that which he sowed. That's why you see blessings that are, are there. But my focus here today is not that. It is something else. Now, we're not just reading about Isaac sowing in the land. I think if you want to get a better picture, let's get to the verse 1 of Genesis 26. What is the Bible telling us? That there was famine in the land beside the first famine that was in the days of Abraham. And the Bible says, And Isaac went to Abimelech, king of the Philistine, in Gerar. Now, if you look where Gerar is in the map, it's just at the border, basically, uh, of, um, of uh, the land of Canaan and to entering into Egypt. Okay? The very border. And so, the Bible says, there's a man, because there's a famine in the land, he's trying to cross into Egypt to save his life, and perhaps that of his livestock. The Lord appeared to him and said, because God knew his intention, he said, do not go down to Egypt. Live in the land of which I shall tell you. And in verse 3, he says, dwell in this land, and I will be with you and will bless you. And so uh, the Lord uh, continued to speak to him. But I want you to understand here that Isaac did not just sow, friend. What we see here is a man who obeyed God. In other words, his sowing was in obedience. And the reason I believe why God has blessed him is not only because he sowed. That is obviously the first spiritual law. You sow and then you reap. But how much more it is to sow with God's blessings. God blessed him because he obeyed the Lord when it was difficult to obey. Think about this just for a moment. There was famine in the land. What do we do in those moments? Human nature seeks for ways to save ourselves, friends. We already know that. So much that sometimes we forsook prayer and begin to rely on human logic. That's what gets us in trouble most of the time. We begin to think about ways to come out of situations. Some situation you won't come out. You're going to have to come out in a hard way. God tell Isaac, dwell in the land and I will bless you. And because he remained in the land and he sowed in the land, which he actually thought was going to be un unfruitful, the Bible says the Lord bless him because he obeyed the Lord when it was difficult to do so. And I want to tell you, church, faith believed God in all seasons. Can you say amen? You can come in a difficult season of your life. And I want to tell you, usually it is easy to give to God. You know, during seasons of no famine, seasons of plenty, anybody can obey God. But do you obey God during famine? Anybody here know how easy it is to give our tithes when there are no, any other needs, right? What about when there are pressuring needs in your life? Will you trust God like Isaac did? 
The Bible says, friend, the just shall live by faith. Can you say amen? And I want to encourage you. What we read here is not just a man who was blessed. He obeyed God when it was difficult to, to do so. And we are learning a lesson as we um, approach uh, this uh, place of worship. Uh, amen. This time of worship this evening. Let's give a lot of praise as I call the ashes to come. Hallelujah. Father, we appreciate you. We thank you for grace, for you are worthy. Hallelujah. We have an opportunity to honor God. Amen. So you are live streaming. There are ways you can give this evening. So we want to pray. Father, in Jesus' name, thank you that you have always been faithful to us, God, and you remain so to provide for us, to take care of us, Lord. Not only that, in you, Lord, we live, we move, and we have our being. I ask you, Lord, that you bless the obedience of your people, that you rejoice, O oh Lord, in the offerings of your people as we offer up our hearts to you. We thank you, Lord, for all the substance and the blessings you have given us, not only now, but over the years, God. Bless the offering and the giver. In Jesus' name, amen. So let's give this evening. Ask some questions in the area of Advent. And um, we're going to look at uh, this reality. And when you talk about Advent, obviously, we are talking about the season of anticipating Christmas. And obviously, for the saints who lived in the Old Testament, this has to do with uh, 
all the years they have lived anticipating a savior. And so, connected to that truth is the reality, obviously, of Advent. And so we're going to look at that uh, today. One of the well-known or famous Advent uh, hymn is, O Come, O Come, Emmanuel. And uh, it is popularity in church is great because uh, this hymn perfectly represents the church's cry during the Advent season. And I want you to know, friends, because there are a lot of things that are spiritual that many believers uh, miss out simply because we rush we're rushing through life, okay? And if we're not very careful, things that really should have a greater meaning to us become meaningless. And who loses out? It's not the devil, friend. You lose out. So, you better know that there is a church cry during the Advent season. And all of us as believers, our hearts are to join in that. But of course, we have to understand then how, how we do that. The art and how to position ourselves just to do that. And so this hymn goes, O come, O come, Emmanuel, and ran ransom captive Israel. That moans in lonely exile here until the Son of God appears. Rejoice, rejoice, Emmanuel shall come to thee, O Israel. Very interesting. And so, without understanding of Advent, what happens is that we are deprived of some of the greatest and sacred moments of reflection that are aimed to be actually a source of inner strength and build our faith in Christ Jesus. Church, Advent needs to be a special moment dedicated to build and help our spirituality. In other words, rushing through these moments, as I mentioned earlier, and not recognizing them is a great neglect to our soul and our spiritual well-being. Hence, many people suffer. Many Christians, especially the body of Christ, we suffer. You see, Advent should be a moment of delight to believers. It should not just be a time that we're going to be rushing through, we're going to have a busy schedule, but a season that our soul savor. I'm going to talk about that in giving a meaning, an in-depth meaning of Advent. What is Advent? That is uh, what I want to talk to you about today. Isaiah 40, verse 1 through 5. Let's read our text. The Bible says, and I want you to kind of like, because I'm trying to give as much understanding and this uh, truth is possible. The whole idea is to position yourself in the place of the people of God who lived before Christ, who for years have to accept prophecies. And uh, we call endure because we have to endure sound doctrine. Do you understand some of these prophecies five years ago, 500 years ago, or um, practically uh, before? This is now before Christ. We aren't talking about, uh, um, you know, after the birth of Christ, before Christ. Many of these are even much longer from the very beginning. There have been prophecies about uh, a Savior. And people, believers who lived uh, 
in those days, they have to look forward to a time when a Savior will come. Advent places you in that. So as we read this text then, you have to have in mind what we are actually tapping into. This is the word of the Lord. Isaiah 40, from verse 1, Comfort, comfort my people, says the Lord, says your God. Speak tenderly to Jerusalem and proclaim to her that her hard service has been completed, that her sin has been paid for, that she has received from the Lord's hand double for all her sins. A voice of one calling in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord, make straight uh, in the desert a highway for our God. Little that people knew that those were the words uh, that were going to come out of the mouth of John the Baptist, who was the forerunner of Christ. Basically, as he was asked, and, oh boy, this is, you know, it was just like a prophet speaking back in the days, uh, you know, uh, 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 but he was speaking truth that uh, he saw, he foresaw in the days that he lived because faith always looked forward and embraces uh, the truth uh, and the promises of God. And so he spoke those words, a voice of one calling in the wilderness, prepare the way for the Lord. Make straight uh, in the desert a highway for our God. Every valley shall be raised up, every mountain and hill made low, the rough ground shall become level, and the rich place places a plain. Verse 5, And the glory of the Lord will be revealed, and all people will see it together. For the mouth of the Lord has spoken. Let's pray. Father, thank you that you're here tonight. Thank you for your people who have come. Lord, that you minister grace. Help us, God, as we gain understanding of Advent, anticipating not only as we participate in the real desires and the yearning that the saints of the Old Testament lived with, but as we anticipate the return of our Lord and Savior who will be revealed in glory. Anoint your word, your servant. We thank you in Jesus' name. Everybody say amen. Okay. Let's talk about the history of Advent. So we're going to look at the history and what Advent really means. Now, we are kind of like in a pre-Advent season. So Advent, and I'm saying I'm ministering this for a reason because I know what happens to people during this time. So Advent is a period of four Sundays and four weeks before Christmas. Or sometimes from the first December to Christmas Day. That's, you know, but it varies depending on denominations and depending on the culture, how uh, it benefits the people, and so on. But that is practically the traditional time that is, has been known where people basically uh, observe this, this season of Advent. So, Advent means coming in Latin, okay? It means coming. So, when you talk about Advent, we are talking about coming. So, this is obviously the coming of Jesus into the world. And so, Christians, they use then four Sundays and four weeks of Advent to prepare and then to remember the real meaning of Christmas. That's what we do. They're supposed to do, at least. There's been a long, some years, which uh, I 
personally have never really gotten the church to this place where we observe Advent, minister to believers to understand and begin to participate in that. We usually just wait for Christmas, you preach one or two messages on Christmas, and that is it. All right. But obviously in the past number of years, that has changed. And so there's a need to prepare and remember the real meaning of Christmas. I hope you understand that. And for many Christians that are unfamiliar with the uh, liturgical year, there may be obviously some confusion surrounding the meaning of Advent season. Okay? So some people may know that Advent season focuses on expectations. And they can think that it serves as an anticipation of Christ's birth in the season leading up to, up to Christmas. Okay? And so, this then is part of the story. But you got to understand that there is more to Advent. Okay? In other words, those thoughts aren't wrong. That's just part of the story, but there's more to Advent. And so, then as I mentioned earlier that that word, it's from the Latin word meaning coming, which is a translation of the Greek word par par parousia. So scholars believe that during the 4th and the 5th centuries in Spain and Gaul, Gaul, Advent was a season of preparation for the baptism of new Christ Christians, okay? At the January Feast of uh, Epiphany. So, the celebrations of God's incarnation represented by the visit of the Magi to the baby Jesus, which is, you find this in Matthew 2, 1. And uh, his baptism in uh, the Jordan River by, the bap by John the Baptist, John 1, 29. You have that information. They can read it for your own time. And we're talking about here, what we're reading about here, if you're wondering, is uh, the Feast of Epiphany. What is really is all about. Okay? So what did we say? That obviously, scholars believe that during the 4th and the 5th centuries in Spain and Gaul, Advent was a season of preparation for the baptism of new Christians at the January Feast of Epiphany. Okay? And so everything I said here is, uh, I'm going to say here after is defining, oh, what is this epiphany thing about? It's a celebration of God's incarnation represented by the visit of the Magi to the baby Jesus, his baptism in the Jordan River by John the Baptist, John 1, 29, and his first miracle at Cana, John 2, 1. And so during this season of preparation, Christians would spend 40 days in penance, prayer, and fasting to prepare for this celebration. Originally, there was little connection between Advent and Christmas. So just have that uh, in mind. That's how it was originally. It was just a little connection. By the 6th century, because we just want to give you a little bit of uh, more information here, by the 6th century, however, Roman Christians had tied Advent to the coming of Christ. Okay? But the coming, pay attention here if you want to really learn, but the coming they had in mind was not Christ's first coming in the manger in Bethlehem, but his second coming in the clouds as the judge of the world. That's just how powerful Advent actually becomes, okay, or has been. That the idea that they had, these believers now of the 6th century, the idea of uh, tying Advent to um, um, the coming of Christ, they weren't having in mind as in Christ's 
coming as a baby who was born. No, no, no. You know, in the manger. But uh, they were actually, they had in mind his second coming in the cloud as a judge of the world. Which make it even more relevant for you and I. Can you say amen? Because uh, that is our anticipation. That is what uh, we wait for. So it was not until Middle Ages that Advent season was explicitly uh, linked to Christ's first coming at Christmas. But I like the, the whole understanding in here. Because it positioned the church just at the right place. And you're going to understand more here. So obviously then, we're learning more that Advent symbolizes the present situation of the church in these last days. That's what it does. You can have just some of the information, some of the scripture. I'm going to read to you here. Acts chapter 2, 17, Hebrews uh, um, 1 and 2. There's uh, a real s symbolism of the present church situation in the last days that we are living in. As God's people wait for the return of Christ in glory to consummate uh, his eternal kingdom. That's really what they're waiting for. We're not waiting for Christ to be born in the manger. That has already happened. We celebrate that. And we commemorate that with joy. That thank Jesus a Savior was born. Hallelujah. That I can be saved today. And I can live a life and cry out, I am a child of God. Hallelujah. Now, think with me just for a moment. You see, the church is in a familiar or similar situation to Israel. At the end of uh, the Old Testament, in exile, they are waiting and hoping in prayerful expectation for the coming of the Messiah. That's where Israel was, okay? They, they wanted a savior. And so Israel looked back to God's past gracious actions on their behalf in leading them out of Egypt in the Exodus. They looked back to those things. And also on the basis they called for God once again to act for them. So they, have, they had a basis to trust God, that God once did this for us, and we are trusting and believing him that he's going to do this for us again also. So basically, in the same way, now pay attention here, the church during Advent this is what makes it so important. The church looks back upon Christ coming in the celebration. Okay? We look back. You see, they say looking back at Christ coming in the celebration. While at the same time, we look forward in eager anticipation to the coming of Christ's kingdom. When he returned for his people. That's where Advent places us. So, while Israel would have sung the song in expectation of Christ's first coming, I want you to know that the church now sings the song in commemoration of that first coming and in expectation of the second coming in the future. That's what Advent means to you. This season is more than just, oh my God, that religious people talk about, adv you know, Advent. Oh, friend, there is more. There is richer truth that can impact your very lives and changes you. Um, if you're not very, very careful here, you can miss out on some of this and live a shallow life uh, as a child of God. One uh, 
Catechism describes Advent spirituality very well. Listen to what they, to what they say. It says, uh, When the church celebrates the liturgy of Advent each year, she makes present this ancient expectancy of the Messiah. For by sharing in the long preparation for the Savior's first coming, the faithful renew their ardent desire for his second coming. You better pay attention to that. How do we renew our ardent desire for his second coming? Is obviously by sharing in the long preparation for the Savior's first coming. That position us as the church very, very well. He continued to say, by celebrating the, uh, the uh, pre precursor's birth and martyrdom, the church unites herself to his desire. He must increase, increase, but I must decrease. They say it beautifully. I love the way it's been put. Another meaning of Advent is greatly expressed in the names for communion. You know, communion is, you know, wonderful names. Is called his communion, Eucharist. Eucharist basically means gratitude for the past. Communion obviously has to do with communing with God in the present. And the Lord's Supper is looking forward to the heavenly banquet. Basically, those are three. There's the Eucharist. There is communion, and there is the Lord's Supper. One is focuses, focusing on the past, gratitude for the past. The other has to do with uh, literally uh, just the joy for the present in communion with God. And uh, the Lord's Supper then is anticipation as we look forward uh, to the heavenly banquet. Let's look at the uh, second layer. That was, more, that was enough about... Uh, you know, the definition. Let's look at the, the Advent and the Christian life. And here, our text obviously is focusing on the promise of a Savior. That's the focus of our text, really, when you pay attention to that. There is a wonderful promise of a Savior. You know, sometimes it's very difficult to learn from the scriptures and put ourselves at a place where what it was like to be in a world without a savior. Okay? And in the last message I preached Sunday evening, I really mentioned about how as the Lord is speaking to his disciples, he said, look, many of the prophets, many of the righteous men, they have lived and have longed to have heard the things you are hearing. And to have seen the things you are seeing. <laughs> but of course they haven't. Though they have embraced it through faith. You better know and understand the, how advantaged we are church. So our text verse 1. Comfort, comfort my people says your God. Speak tenderly to Jerusalem. And proclaim to her that her hard service has been completed. That her sin has been paid for. And how wonderful it is because this is the message to many people here today. What a message. That uh, your hard service has been completed. And your sin have been, has, been, have, has been paid for. In other words, while Advent is certainly a time of celebration and anticipation of Christ's birth, church, it is more than that. 
In other words, we got to know that it's only in the shadow of Advent that the miracle of Christmas can be fully understood and appreciated. You see, and again, listen to this very carefully. It's in the shadow of Advent that the miracle of Christmas can be fully understood and appreciated. And again, it's only in the light of Christmas that the Christian life makes any sense. You see, church, we find greater understanding of Christmas in Advent. And we find greater meaning to a Christian life through Christmas. That's really what he's simply saying there. But at the heart of it all, whether it is looking back in the past, the present or the future, there is a promise of a Savior. Savior who was going to save them. The job has already been completed. The Savior who is saving now, and the Savior who is obviously going to complete the work of salvation in the future. There is a promise of a Savior. In other words, it is between the fulfilled promise of Christ's first coming and the yet-to-be-fulfilled promise of his second coming that a man named Karl Barth, he wrote this following word. Listen to what he said. That unfulfilled and fulfilled promise are related to each other. As are dawn and dawn and sunrise. Both promise and in fact the same promise. If anywhere at all, then it's precisely in the light of the coming of Christ that faith has become Advent faith. The expectation of future revelation but faith knows for whom and for what it is waiting. It is a fulfilled faith because it lay hold on the fulfilled promise. How wonderful he says that. You see, church, the promise for Israel and the promise for the church is Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. It is Jesus Christ. He has come and he will come again. This is the essence of Advent. And I want to say, friends, don't lose moments that are very important to you because we are so busy with everything else. Our minds are preoccupied with every plan that we have except the planning for the very reality here. Yeah? that truly impacts our lives for eternity. Nothing else impacts your life for eternity than your Christian life. You see, Advent helps us to deal with the present reality of life. That's what it does. It reminds us that our lives are part of a larger story of God's creation, His redemption, and His restoration. These are reminders. I quote, this wonderful person said, The Christian year, by its rhythms, allow us an opportunity to both look back and remember the story of Christ, and to look forward to its ultimate conclusion, said Bobby Gross in an interview about his book, Living the Christian Year, Time to Inhabit the Story of God. That's the name of the book. The Christian year participates in that same sacramental pattern that God instituted and blessed for the people in the Old Testament and the New Testament to help us remember in a very active way and anticipate in a way that brings grace into our present spiritual experience. How well said. In other words, the Lord has, he has placed things and positioned his church. He has done things in a way that 
This is going to help us remember. It's in an active way. There has to be a, an active involvement and anticipate in a way that brings grace into our present spiritual experience. Meaning that Advent must impact us right now. It's not a season to be lived through uh, somehow uh, and we just pass through it without impact. That's why messages like this has to be preached to help us truly appreciate uh, the wonderful graces of God, not just in the past, uh, but even uh, in the present uh, right now. It was a testimony of a person whose life has been impacted by observing Advent. And uh, Listen quickly to what they say here. Yeah. I remember an advent when I was struggling with uh, infertility and found it difficult to enter into a season that anticipates the birth of a baby. During church on those Sunday evenings leading up to Christmas Day, at least you know that you thought you are the one who attends Sunday evening services, you know. You're wrong. And Wednesdays, okay? So let me just read it again. During church on those Sunday evenings, <laughs> leading up to Christmas Day, a different family, a mother, a father, and at least one child, lit the Advent wreath candles and read the scripture about the coming of our Savior. While I sat in the dim light of the sanctuary and observed, observed those who had that for which I longed, for, I longed, other parents whispered to their children, answering questions about the wreath and the candles or asking the, the, the rudier little ones to settle down. I saw my pregnant friends spring, sprinkled uh, through the congregation whose desires to become mothers were being fulfilled, their bellies full and round. I knew Emmanuel had come. Now think about this. These are thoughts that many times don't go through people because you are, you are not in that situation all right but obviously there are those who just long to have a little one that they can tell hey hey baby shh, shh, shh. you know you see what i'm saying somebody will be observe that and they, they just think it's so nice asking a child the question hey what does this mean what, you know and all that uh, they are they, they are longing for that I remember one of my friend, um, it's a good friend that is a pastor. He kept having guilt. And uh, one time he's telling me, well, man, I'm going to, you know, he's, he's been praying for a boy. Thank God he has now. But those days, you know, he's praying. He say, you know what, uh, when, you know, when the baby comes, uh, the boy, I'm going to do this. We're going to do this. You know, he's thinking all the wonderful things uh, he was going to do. You know, obviously, you know, for me it was nothing because I have sons. Many. Glory be to God. And so, but I'm saying this to help you to understand that in the thoughts of people who are in certain situations, there are some of the things that you never even perhaps uh, never crossed your mind. He's a person during Christmas. You know, Advent season rather. And it's an anticipation of a baby, all right, to be born. And um, they are observing what is happening. And they don't miss any detail that most of you that perhaps are not in that situation would never even come close to think about. Can you imagine? They're looking at uh, those, uh, you know, parents, people with children, whispering to the children, answering questions, uh, you know, uh, uh, Looking at pregnant people and they think it's just beautiful. And if you are pregnant, probably don't even think, what beauty is this now, right? 
And so uh, why does somebody who's just, oh my goodness, look at them. Their belly is full and round, right? She's thinking of these things. And she said, I knew Emmanuel had come. I believed Jesus would return, but I didn't know if I would ever have a child of my own. I wanted to believe God was always good even if I never became a mother, but I was full of doubt, and my, my doubt made me lonely. I don't follow church year. I don't follow the church year with the intent of diminishing my loneliness. I observe it to know more intimately the life of Jesus. You understand that? His work in the lives of those whom he has rescued and the redeem, and redeemed and the hope of the not yet on this side of heaven. I also enter into the liturg liturgical season because they help us wait, lament, hope, celebrate, and acknowledge the full spectrum of the life of the Christian and the, f the life of the church. But one blessing I have received from engaging the church year and it is rituals is an increased sense of belonging to myself, others, and God. This is the testimony. How wonderful this is. You see, church, we better understand Advent and how it impacts your Christian life. Let's close and look at uh, anticipating uh, the revelation of the Lord's glory. You are expecting the revelation of the Lord's glory. In our text, Isaiah offers comfort and consolation to the people of God. And these people were living in desperate times. That is the goodness of God. You know, they are living in desperate times. And what is the goodness of God? Is Isaiah bringing comfort and consolation to these people? Because God, no matter the, how hard seasons can be, God does not forsake his people. Can you say amen? He said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. That's just the reality of God. So our greatest hope, church in Advent, is a promise of a revelation of the Lord's glory. That's our greatest hope. The promise of the revelation of the Lord's glory. Verse 5, and the, the glory of the Lord will be revealed. Hallelujah. That's the promise. And all the people will see it all together. For the mouth of the Lord has spoken. This is the promise of God. That the glory of the Lord has been, will be revealed. Perhaps one person who had uh, that revealed to him was, was Moses. However... Moses was only able to, to do that on that side of life. We, we had to, we have a privilege to be able to hear it now. But you know, on the Mount of Transfiguration, what really happened there is that uh, Jesus with uh, three of his disciples, they were there, and you know how they appeared to uh, um, Moses and Elijah. They were there. And Christ was transfigured in his uh, full glory. Hallelujah. And uh, not his clothes, but his body. And the light that came out of the body of Christ was so great and radiant, uh, to, there's no way to describe it, uh, that his very garment became white, basically. Moses was able to see that. Very interesting. The glory was revealed on that mount. But yet, friends, you can't, obviously, 
be in this body of the flesh. And I believe be able to see that. Even for Moses in the text that we have read that I, that I just referred to here, it has to be when he is in eternity and the vision was showed to these disciples who wrote the text of what has happened on that mount. Some of the things they were forbidden to speak. But they saw glory revealed. But what we are talking about here is going to be much greater. You better understand that. He said, all the people will see it together. For the mouth of the Lord has spoken. This verse obviously was fulfilled uh, first uh, when Christ was born in Bethlehem of Judea. In Luke 3, 6, the Bible says, uh, in all flesh, which is all people, shall see the salvation, uh, which is the glory of God. And so, God's glory is revealed in his power to save the lost and to heal broken lives. That's part of it. So there is glory revealed at Christ's birth, in his life, his ministry, and his church, and glory to be revealed in us at his return. Romans 8. 18 says, I reckon that the suffering of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. I close with this uh, relics taken. This song which was sung by Bob Fitz. He will come and save you. That the, this relic says, say to those who are fearful hearted, do not be afraid. The Lord your God will come and with his, might, with his mighty arm, when you call on his name, he will come and save you. There's a chorus, he will come and save you. Say to the weary one, your God will surely come, he will come and save you. Lift up your eyes to him. You will rise again. He will come and save you. He continues to say, Say to those who are brokenhearted, do not lose your faith. The Lord your God will come and with his loving hand, when you call on his name, he will surely come. He will come and save you. These uh, wonderful words uh, uh, encouragement, especially in the season we are about to enter. And the reason why I'm saying this uh, at this moment is for preparation. For us to understand that we can't treat the season of Advent casually, running about everything else. Uh, we better understand what Advent means to you as a Christian, the preparation that uh, we obviously must uh, um, engage in the benefits that are there to your soul and your spiritual life. Advent has a greater meaning. This isn't just some things, that, oh my God, those old uh, traditional, uh, you know, Christians, uh, you know, maybe Presbyterians and others uh, has uh, commemorated. Uh, oh, it's a reality uh, that must still impact uh, our lives today. Let's give the Lord praise. Hallelujah. Father, we appreciate you. We thank you for grace, for your worth. Hallelujah. Heads bowed, eyes are closed in the presence of the living God. What is Advent? Folks, we should not be carried away in this fast moving life. And miss out the very thing the Lord has for you and I. Before we take time to pray on these altars, there are believers, the Lord is speaking to you. We are going to come before him on these altars. 
positioning ourselves that I will live my life differently this season of Advent. I will deliberately position myself to participate, not just to find myself uh, only in those moments uh, when I'm in church, uh, but literally during my own time that I will observe rich scriptures that bring this to remembrance and celebration. Perhaps there are others you have come, you cannot honestly say if you die, heaven is home. Friends, God cares about you. He paid a price. When we are talking about the promise of a Savior back in the days, we talk about People who live lives and they couldn't save themselves. The physical life was evident already. The physical life that they lived in under oppression of foreign nations. Some of these were strong nations. But the Lord proclaimed himself in the midst of those oppressions that the Lord God is mighty, mighty to save, mighty to deliver, mighty to heal. And even this day, that has not changed. There is power to save. Those who cannot save themselves, those who will come to God and say, Lord, I need your salvation. If today you can be honest. In preparation for Advent, I want to give my life to Jesus. I want to surrender. I want to live differently. There's a wonderful grace of God. He forgives. And He forgives freely. You're not saved. Or you are backslidden. Lord is calling you. Give me your heart. Raise your hand. Put it up high. Pastor, this is my hand. I want to give my life to Jesus. We will pray with you. If there's anybody quickly, before we do anything else, lift your hand. I think about the young kids here. God bless you. Anyone else? I need Jesus. I want to be forgiven. You just raise your hand quickly before we continue. We'll give an opportunity to receive Christ. Receive forgiveness. The wages of sin is death. The Lord bless you. I see that hand. Anybody else? Quickly. Join others who lift their hand. You may put your hand down, my dear. God bless you. Anyone else? Quickly. Pastor, pray with me. I need Jesus. I want to be forgiven. It's the blood of Jesus that cleanses us from all sins. Is there anyone else? Quickly. Raise your hand. We'll pray with you. Hallelujah. Glory be to God. I want to pray with those that lift your hands. Would you come? Bring that young person in the back, lift their hands. Come. God bless you. Thank you. I want the sister to come. Amen. Yeah, face me. Face me here. Just face me. God bless you. Thank you for your honesty. Hallelujah. Would you kneel down? May the Lord bless you. Kneel down. God bless you. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Oh, Rebo, Rebo, Shantai. We give you glory, Lord. We give you glory. We give you honor. We give you adoration. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. In the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. In the name of Jesus. Work a miracle, Lord. Thank you. Hallelujah. I want to open the altars for believers. I want you to come. Find a place to pray in the presence of the living God. Hallelujah. What does Advent mean to you now that you have learned what you learned today? How is your behavior in this season?
Hallelujah. We give you glory. We give you honor. We give you adoration, God. Hallelujah. Let's cry out to the Lord. Father, we thank you. We thank you, God. Thank you for your grace, your presence. Thank you for your mercies, dear God, that fail not. They are new every morning. Your compassions, my God. Come on, church. Thank him for his goodness in the past, in the present, in the future. Who he is to you now. Our God is great. Hallelujah. We thank you, Lord. We give you adoration. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. You are worthy. You are worthy. May our hearts and life be reminded of the goodness of God. Oh, God, the Korebo Rebo Shantai. That the promises of God are yes and amen. And your promises fail not. Oh, God, the Korebo Rebo Shantai. We give you adoration. We give you honor for you are worthy. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. We sing that song. Hallelujah.
on, come on, church. Hallelujah. We give you honor. We give you praise. You are worth the Lord. Thank you. For your promises fail not, dear Lord. Hallelujah. God, faith. Give for your promises. Praise be to God. Praise be to the Lord. Well, friends, this isn't just, oh my goodness, we're just trying our best to make sure that we keep the church open during the busiest moment, you know, of well, the busiest season of the year. Oh no, it's more than that, friend. We are talking about how do a Christian order their steps in the time that is most important to them. We aren't talking about some stories of uh, Jan van Riebeek and all other guys, uh, Christopher Columbus and others. We're talking about a Savior, Jesus Christ. And that matters not just to us, but to the world. Do we position ourselves to make an impact for Jesus? Do we position ourselves to be impacted by the quality and the value of the season? Or do we go about practically as the world is? You better understand much of the thing you see today are strategies to deviate you from and to distract you from things that truly will impact your soul in a way that honors God. We cannot fall for that. We must be at a place where we are deliberately calculating our steps to make sure that in all my action, I'm making my plans and I'm making up every step I take take uh, to make sure that I participate in the purposes and the things uh, that glorify God in this season. It's a busy world, friend. Uh, we put position ourselves intentionally. There will be people that your life would have impacted because you position yourself in a way that your soul can be enriched by the richness of the season through the acts of the things that God has done and the things that the Lord is doing now. So you better understand this. is just some kind of motivation and encouragement you know come and just stay in church you know it's just so nice be part of the Christmas banquet well it goes beyond that the message of Advent is a very powerful message bringing us to our senses in this world full of insanity and confusion You know, sometimes during this time, there's hardly a distinction between believers and unbelievers. And unbelievers. Uh, because our actions are the same. Take advantage. Prepare for Advent. Praise be to God. We're going to dismiss those that are live streaming and you want to receive Christ, there's a number there you can call and uh, we'll gladly lead you in prayer and uh, give information where our church is. Wherever you are <laughs> in any nation. <laughs> well, friend, tomorrow, 11 o'clock, intelligence briefing. Um, be part of that. It's going to be great. May the Lord bless you. God loves you. I do love you all. We want to dismiss in the word of prayer. <clears throat> Thank you, Lord.
that you are here. Thank you for the impact and the ministry, the edification, God, and direction. That you cause us to purposely position ourselves in a way that our souls and our lives will be impacted and enriched by this season of Advent we are about to enter in and that our actions, Lord, and steps will bring glory to your name and uh, will cause you, Lord, uh, to reveal yourself uh, to the world uh, through your church as we show faithfulness. We thank you, Lord. Bless your people as they go out. In Jesus' name, amen. You can be dismissed.